Our Lord Jesus Christ was born into the most bloody and violent hundred years in the history of Israel. Revolution was in the air. False messiahs arose. Zealots took up weapons. And a forest of crosses sprung up around the Roman Empire. Jesus was the only one who was crucified in that time. Crucifixion was Rome's answer to rebellion. Jesus himself was unjustly convicted and executed for sedition. It was in such a context of conflict and war and violence that Jesus incited and preached the most radical revolution in human history. Whether you're watching online or here on site, I invite you to stand as I read my text, Matthew 11, verse 12, and the parallel verse in Luke, verses six, uh, six, Luke 16, verse 16. Matthew 11, verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. And I invite you to read with me together aloud Luke 16, verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it. Please remain standing a moment. This is the language of revolution, and this is the title and the theme of my message. What is the kingdom of heaven? Why does the kingdom suffer violence? Why is force required to enter the kingdom, and how? Do we take the kingdom by force? Would you open your heart and join me in prayer as we ask the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to have mercy upon us. And we pray that you would speak your word into our hearts. This is your word, Lord Jesus. You spoke this word. You preached this revolution. You incited this revolution. And we pray, O oh God, that we would, we would hear from your word today and that we would respond with open hearts. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is many things. It's a rescue. It's a great reversal. It's a revelation. But among those and many other things, the kingdom of God is also and absolutely a revolution. Back in 1978, I was caught up in the middle of a bloody revolution in an African country. There were bullets flying over our heads. And I have to admit, though I didn't take sides, it was rather exciting and rather tantalizing to be right in the middle of it, because I was staying right in the middle of all, you know, all the ministry buildings. I happened to just be there uh, in a hostel. And it, it only took one day for the revolutionaries to take over. And I remember the speech that the revolutionary made from his fighter jet and how excited he was. And it was truly um, an experience that one does not soon forget. But the revolution that Jesus preached and incited was not against any government or state. It was against the rule of Satan and the tyranny of sin over the human race. And this is the only true revolution. Because in this revolution, we don't execute others, but we crucify ourselves on behalf of others. I forgot to mention 
The day after the revolution, I heard intermittent shots in a distance, and later on I found out that that, that was the uh, members of the old regime that had just been ousted who were being executed one by one. In this revolution that Jesus preached and incited, we do not execute others. We execute ourselves. We crucify ourselves on behalf of others. As Thomas Merton wrote, this is the most complete revolution that has ever been preached. In fact, it is the only true revolution because all others demand the extermination of somebody else, but this one means the death of your own self. And so today I want to invite you to be a part of this revolution, of this war that we are all born into, whether we like it or not. And each one of us must decide which side we will fight for. Now don't misunderstand me. The kingdom of God comes without your help or mine. Our struggle is not to build the kingdom. Jesus is doing that. Our struggle is to be included, to participate, to be part of this kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is a revolution. Second, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. Why? Obviously, because it's a revolution. What revolution doesn't suffer of violence? But what kind of violence? There is evil in this world, and there is evil on the inside of every one of us that opposes the will of God and the rule of God and the kingdom of God and all who strive to enter it. For example, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These are things inside of us. And then outside of us, persecution, principalities and powers. And we all need to be aware of how much the internet and social media and artificial technology are taking control of our lives. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. We are born into this war in occupied territory under a cruel tyrant who opposes the kingdom of God. And Jesus came to overthrow that old regime. The kingdom of God, like Ukraine today, is under violent assault. Third, Jesus said the violent, the violent ones, take it by force. He was using the language of revolution, but not the kind of revolution that the zealots who wanted to overthrow the Roman government were thinking about. But he was talking about a spiritual violence that we must exercise in order to take hold of the kingdom of God. It's not that the kingdom opposes us. No, never. Jesus said it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. No, it's the evil inside of us and the evil in the world that opposes us every step of the way. You remember John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress, and how Christian the Pilgrim decided to make the journey to the heavenly city, but he first had to find the gate, and he only needed to knock on the gate that led the way in order for it to open. But when he approached the gate, he was resisted on every side by evil powers and evil forces and also the resistance that was on the inside of him. And so he had to storm the gate like a desperado. And so it's not the kingdom that opposes us. It's the evil in us and around us that we need to come to terms with and recognize how aggressive and how incessant and how formidable this evil is. And this evil must be met with an even greater force on our part. Agonizing force. Jesus said the way is hard 
and the gate is narrow, and few are they who find it. The kingdom is preached. Everyone forces his way into it. I mentioned my time in Africa. You know, that was maybe 40 years ago, I guess, and public transportation was not anything like you have in Singapore today, as you can imagine. And I had to take a bus from the capital city to the interior, and it seemed like the whole population was trying to get in one bus, that narrow little door of that bus, and so many hundreds of people crowding and milling around and pressing toward that bus. And I had to press my way. I had to force my way into the middle of that crowd. And then after that, the crowd just pressed me towards the door. And when I finally reached the door, <laughs> my struggle wasn't over because my bag was caught in the press of people. And I had to exercise force to yank my bag out of the, the like packed together like sardines. And then I finally got onto the bus. The gate is narrow. The way is hard. <laughs> We must force our way into the kingdom of heaven. So how do we do that? How do we take the kingdom by force? I want to spend the rest of my time trying to answer that question, and may the Lord help me. And I will limit my answer to the two barest essentials. One, we need to confront and crucify the passions of the flesh. And two, we need to acquire and practice the virtues of the kingdom of heaven. That's the kind of force we need to apply to take the kingdom. Both of these exploits require divine grace plus human effort. Let me alert you that this message emphasizes human effort. I'm aware of the divine grace. None of us would have even be here in this church apart from the grace of God. But so often we hear messages about the grace of God and the love of God and the mercy of God. But today, please allow me to be one-sided. And please don't take offense at me. And I'm not underestimating divine grace, but today for once at least, I want to emphasize the human effort that we must make along with God's grace to enter the kingdom of heaven. So first we must confront and crucify the passions and practices of the flesh that would categorically exclude us from the kingdom of God. Now, I'm going to give you a list of vices from the New Testament. I'm going to go very fast. Uh, I'm going to show you the scriptures and the list of 47 vices, 47 vices that categorically exclude people from the kingdom of God, regardless of creed. First of all, the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21, ranging from sorcery to wild parties. Some of these are very grave sins. Some of these are mild sins, strife, jealousy, things that some of us do every day and think nothing of it. But Paul said these vices could exclude us from God's kingdom. Also, Jesus said, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles human nature, but what comes out of the mouth, evil, out of the heart, evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, and all the way down the list, to slander and pride and foolishness, such as you find on the internet and social media every day. We shouldn't even look at that stuff, much, much less post it. We must remember that every idle word, whether from your mouth or from your keyboard or from your touchscreen, is recorded in heaven, and we shall have to give account on judgment day. 
So these are things that defile our nature and could exclude us from the kingdom of God. The passions and practices that land people in the lake of fire in Revelation 21, 8, ranging from murder to lying. And the vices that exclude people from the city of God and the tree of life in Revelation 21, verse 15. Sodomy, unnatural sex, sorcery, murder, idolatry, falsehood. Notice that lying, even lying is one of the sins that could exclude us. Some of us lie every day and don't even think about it. And finally, Colossians 3, verse 5 and 6, the passions and practices that incur the wrath of God, ranging from sexual immorality to greed or covetousness, evil desire, impurity. There were 47 things on that list. Some of them are repeated, so it's not 47 in all. But all of these are merely representative of grave sins that will exclude us from the kingdom of God if we don't repent. And Paul said, I warn you, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So to enter the kingdom of God, we need to take this vice list seriously and examine ourselves often and allow the Holy Spirit to convict us of these sins and that we also must make the effort to overcome them before they destroy us. And this is where force is required. We must do violence to ourselves. We need to turn the weapons of spiritual warfare on ourselves. Listen to the word of the Lord. Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with their passions and desires. As I said earlier, we don't crucify others. We crucify ourselves. Colossians 3, verse 5 and 6, put to death what is earthly in you. 1 Peter 2, verse 11, abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. This is where the spiritual warfare really starts in our lives before we go do spiritual mapping and look for demons outside of us, we need to wage war against the passions of the flesh that war against our souls. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, let us cleanse ourselves. The blood of Jesus is provided, but you've got to do your own laundry. You've got to apply every day confess our sins and ask Jesus to cleanse us with his precious blood. In Romans 8, 13, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you by the spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. As Pastor mentioned, we've been in Singapore since 1990. On arrival, we managed to get one of those old black and white British army barracks. They were cheap then unrenovated, no air conditioning, high ceiling, ceiling fans, and windows all around. And I love to open the windows, all the windows, even in storms. But my wife would go around closing them. But most of the time, they were open. And one evening, my little boy, Jaken, came into my bedroom and cried, Papa, Papa, come to the kitchen. There was such an urgency in his voice that I made haste. And when I came to the kitchen, I saw that there was a swarm of bees, huge black bees circling, swarming and circling around the light. Well, I wasn't trying to be a hero, but something had to be done. So I took a newspaper and I rolled it up and I charged and I swung and I whacked and I walloped until I drove every single bee out of the kitchen. Next night, my son came to the bedroom again and said, the bees are back. That's just how it is with sin. You need to whack and wallop every day. 
And some, there are certain sins that are just like bees. They just keep coming back. And so we need more than a newspaper. Next day, I called the Ministry of Environment, and they sent Sylvester Stallone with a blowtorch. And he found a beehive right outside our second floor window, and he exterminated them. And Paul said, if you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. We need more than a newspaper. We need the power and the fire of the Holy Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body that we might live the new life in Christ. And this requires force. Like Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 29 to 30, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. 127 hours is a true story. You may have seen the movie. Aaron Ralston was hiking with a backpack and he got caught in an avalanche and his arm got lodged between a boulder and the face of a cliff. And he was suspended there for four or five days. And on the third or fourth day, he began to, he finally realized that he was going to die unless he did something radical. So he decided to amputate his arm. But the only thing he had was a pocket knife. And so he started went to work, cutting off his own arm with a knife. But he ran into trouble when he hit the bone. He just couldn't cut through the bone. And so in the end, he had to break his arm. And it felt so good. Because he knew that he would live. Of course, it hurt. You can see his face. But it felt so good. And when we confront the works of the flesh in our lives, when we take the sword of the spirit and operate on our own hearts, yes, it hurts. It's painful but it feels so good because it's a matter of life and death. And if a man would cut off his arm, his physical arm, in order to survive, in order to live, how much more? And so that's what Jesus is talking about, not physical amputation, but to cut out like Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. And who wants to cut out a piece of his own heart? But that's what we need to do. Like that um, medic, that army medic who was stranded in a remote area and he didn't have any surgical tools and he contracted acute appendicitis and he had to take his little army can opener, those little foldable can openers, so small they fit in your wallet. And he had to amputate his appendix with a can opener. Such was the drive to survive, to, to preserve his human life. What about the soul? Many of us are oblivious of how much danger our souls are in if we do not confront the things that would destroy us, the works of the flesh that I have shared with you on that list. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Only God can destroy evil, but our part is to fight against the evil in our hearts, like gladiators fighting with wild beasts 
in the arena that are trying to destroy us. Mark the Hermit said, the fear of God compels us to fight against evil. And when we fight against evil, the grace of God destroys it. So here is the human effort and the divine grace working together hand in hand. And we also see that in Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Please notice, he will not do it without your feet. And so take off your shoes and get ready to crush the head of the serpent. Jesus did that on the cross, but the final blow will be dealt by Jesus in his second coming, and he's going to use every one of us to overthrow evil in this present age fully and finally. And many of us are oblivious to this battle for our souls. And so we get bored and we play computer games instead because crucifying the flesh isn't exciting enough for us. So we surf and shop online and we fight all the wrong battles like all these conspiracy theories about vaccination. May the Lord help us and deliver us from all these distractions and help us to focus on what really counts. Take the kingdom of heaven by force. And to do that, we need to crucify the passions and practices that would exclude us from the kingdom. And secondly, not in sequence, but at the same time, we must acquire and cultivate and practice the virtues of the kingdom of heaven that secure inclusion and admission into the kingdom. Now, just as I gave you a list of vices, now I will give you a list of virtues. Take a moment to look at them. The qualities of love in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7. Now, as I said earlier, uh, you know, if your leaders agree and if they find my PowerPoint free from heresy, uh, you're welcome to ask for it and you can have a copy of it. So you don't have to try and memorize all this or look at and read at every word of it. But I just want you to see, as in Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, the fruit of the Spirit, and the Beatitudes of Jesus in Matthew 5, verses 3 to 11. Mercy, purity of heart, poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, meekness, and so on. And the virtues that open the gate of the kingdom, according to 2 Peter 1, verses 5 to 7. Peter said, well, take a moment to look at it before I advance the slide, faith, virtue, knowledge. And these are all listed in 1 Peter uh, sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. Peter said, you must make every effort. Please notice that. Would you read that first line together with me? You must make every effort to add to your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge and self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. In verse 10, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these things, you will never fall. For in this way, an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be provided richly for you. Do you see that the word of God says that if we confront the vices and practice the virtues, the kingdom of heaven, the narrow gate that is so difficult to squeeze into, like a camel squeezing through the eye of a needle, an opening will be richly provided for us. And therefore, I urge you, all of us, myself included, to make every effort. Force yourself to do good when you don't even feel like it. Force yourself to pray when you want to play. Force yourself to pity when you want to punish. 
force yourself to patience when you want to push and shove. Force yourself to purity when your mind wanders and your eyes rove. Force yourself to love when you want to hate. Force yourself in Lent to fast when you want to feast. And when your cab driver goes the wrong way and argues with you, bless him with a kind word and a generous tip. This is not hypocrisy. This is how to avoid hypocrisy. Confront the vices and practice the virtues even when you don't feel like it. Force yourself. My wife and I had the privilege of being pastored by Jack Hayford in Van Nuys, California back in the late 80s. And one day he told a story that, I mean, one of the delightful things about Pastor Jack was that he was not afraid to be transparent and make himself vulnerable and also to confess his own weaknesses. And he and 12 other well-known Christian leaders in America were invited to meet with President Bill Clinton in the White House. And after the meeting, 11 of them were put in a five-star hotel, but one of them was invited to stay in the White House. And it wasn't Jack Hayford. And he was upset about that. And he told us honestly how he felt when he heard that one of their number had been invited to stay in the White House. And he looked at his five-star hotel and it wasn't good enough for him. And he said, how come I wasn't invited to stay in the White House? Isn't that just like me? Isn't that just like many of us? And Pastor Jack Hayford recognized the spirit of envy that was trying to take hold of his heart. And he took up the sword of the spirit. And he began to use it on himself. And he wrestled with that spirit of envy for as long as it took until he overcame it and he destroyed it. And he said it felt, and this was his text, that he, his, his soul felt like a weaned child. No more feed on demand. No more insisting on his own way. Oh, how wonderful it would be to be completely set free of greed and envy and all the other vices that I've spoken about today. Peter of Damascus said, we are under obligation to do what is good even against our will, for we still pander to ourselves, our passions, our pleasures, to the comfort of our bodies and our own desires. And so it is with many of us, we excuse ourselves, we spare ourselves, we pamper ourselves, and we are so soft on sin. And as long as we are like that, it is going to require force. But Peter of Damascus also says that once we have attained love, those who have attained to perfect love have the power to do what is good without having to force themselves. They rejoice in doing it and never wish to cease. There is a place we can reach in our walk with God where we do what is right, joyfully and spontaneously, without even thinking about it and without having to force ourselves. That is the life that Jesus lived. That is the revolution that Jesus preached. And that is the revolution that he invites us all to be a part of for the rest of our life. Let me summarize. The kingdom of heaven is a revolution. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. The violent take by force. This does not mean that we conquer the kingdom, but rather 
that the kingdom conquers us. Our old self, our false and fallen self that always trips us up. Revelation 12, 11, they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. This is a revolution. This is a victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Today, I have tried to preach this revolution to you through my lips of clay. This is the only true revolution. I want to invite you to join this revolution. Would you please stand to your feet? The French philosopher Jacques Ellul said, and I'm not quoting this as in my own words, the highest form of freedom is the capacity to recognize the things that control us and the strength and the courage to resist them. The things that control us all the vices and passions and desires of the flesh I shared with you today. And not to mention the external things such as internet and Facebook, and I shouldn't mention the platform, social media and artificial intelligence. The things that try to control us, the highest form of freedom is the capacity to recognize these things and to confront them and to resist them even to the point of shedding our blood. So this is the greatest adventure in all human experience and I invite you to decide as in the matrix which pill will it be the blue pill or the red pill. Decide now. May the Lord awaken us. To join this resistance movement against the kingdom of darkness, I invite you now to examine yourself. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? and recalled some of the things on the list of vices that I showed you and allowed the Holy Spirit to show you the ones that are getting out of control in your life and ruling you and declare war against them today. Pray for the courage to resist, the strength and the courage to fight back. Your soul is at stake, your freedom, your joy, your peace, your shalom. And don't stop there. Remember the virtues of the kingdom of heaven, the list that I've shown you. Allow the Holy Spirit to show where you are lacking and to help you to acquire and cultivate and put these into practice. This is the most important, the most difficult, the most exciting, and the most rewarding work you ever do. The work that you do in your own heart. And in this way, says Peter, you will confirm your calling and election, and you will never fall. Would you continue to respond as the worship team leads us to the altar of God? Let us worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Come on. 
sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O Lord, O God, you will not despise. Church, in our struggle to confront the vices, may God help us to overcome as we practice the virtues. Father God, you know our struggle towards obedience, towards Christ-likeness. We look towards you and trust you for divine grace to overcome and be victorious. Because with you and in you, all things are possible. And Lord, we will echo the words of John the Baptist and say, Let Christ increase and I decrease. And may the God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and among us now and always. Amen. Church, service is over. Continue, remember, confront the vices and practice the virtues. God bless you.